From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. A production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. Welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. They call me Ben. We are joined, as always, with our super producer, Paul, Mission Control Deck, and most importantly, you are you, and you are here. That makes this stuff they don't want you to know. A quick check-in. Matt, how's it going? How you doing? Hey, doing well. Hey, you like the Fonz over here. Yeah. (laughs) I like Uh, it. Things, yeah, things are, are going well. I, I had this weird hair last night where I noticed on the back fence of my property, there's just a ton of uh, junk growing up around the fence and through the fence and on its old chain link fence. And it's mostly like vines of some sort. Mm-hmm. And I just, I couldn't help it. I just started destroying all the vines and just Classic ripping them man. out. And Was just a machete? Like, no. Just did you, sow the, did you wow. sow the earth with salt? Oh, I did. <laughs> nice, nice. I've it always wanted to, literal, to literally do that. Yeah. Is that where the expression salt of the earth comes from or is that different? I'm not familiar with mm. the etymology there. No, yeah. Neither. In this case, it's killing all this stuff that's trying to grow mm. out. You're doing more of a scorched earth approach. Yeah. yeah. What about you, Noel? Checking in. How's I'm it going? Doing well. Uh, thanks, Ben. I, I got to, to piggyback a business trip with a family vacation. I brought my kid with me to New York City and she hung out with her godmother for a couple days while I worked and we had adventures and it was a lot of fun. Awesome. Mm -hmm. And the check-in that we like to institute applies to you as well, listening. So if you have an event in your life that you would like to to tell us and uh, your fellow listeners about, feel free. You don't have to wait till the episode is over. You could just pause it and give us a call now. We are 1-833-STDWYTK. And today we are off to camp. No, not a summer camp. Not a religious camp, uh, none of those sorts of camps. We're going to a camp that is much more dangerous. Uh, We're exploring a genuine, literally explosive conspiracy as well as a conspiracy theory. How can both of those exist concurrently? Well, we will tell you. Enter Camp Minden. Here are the facts. So there's a place called Webster Parish. It's off of U.S. Highway 80 near Doyline, Louisiana, between Minden, Louisiana, and Bossier or Bossier City, probably Bossier City, Louisiana. This thing, Camp Minden, is part of a larger compound called the Louisiana Army Ammunition Plant, or LAP. L-A-A-P. Yeah, and the history of this place goes all the way back to the beginning of 19. 19- 39. And the government, uh, that is when the government used eminent domain, which you were mentioning off air, Ben, we have yet to do an episode on. I think we might need to correct that. Um, They used this concept of eminent domain to acquire the land before the United States entered World War II. Yeah, this uh, this compound is just under 15,000 acres. Uh, originally, it had a couple of different names. It was the Louisiana Ordnance Plant, or it was called the Shell Plant, uh, alluding to, of course, artillery shells. And for the entirety of its time, since uh, since it was fully acquired, beginning in 39, going to 41, it has been owned by Uncle Sam, but this is an important distinction, it has been operated by private contractors. So back to back to this this history right laap was completed in just 11 months under the direction of a contractor silas mason at the time this was middle of nowhere country it was uh well we're a family show it was just east of bumble f if you know what i mean yeah uh, and there were very few people here so from a uh, congressional or state pork budget kind of perspective, it makes sense to have this kind of operation there, especially if you're dealing with ordinance or something that might be dangerous. You don't want that in downtown New Orleans, right? Yeah. And it also makes sense of uh, the time that they that they needed a lot of ammunition was right around World War II, right? So uh, in May 1942, there were a total of eight production lines that were opened. 
And then by December 1944, the number of employees hit its peak at just under 11,000, 10,754. Uh, and that was in the month of the Battle of the Bulge. That is a major operation. Yeah. Well, I mean, think about all the ammunition that was deployed during that conflict during World War II. Um, we needed a lot of it. This they were not. They were certainly not creating all of the ammunition, sure. but uh, a good portion of it. And then the plant was uh, deactivated after uh, after the summer of 1945, right, with VJ Day. But here is a spooky fact. This is one of my favorite things from the research. This place, Camp Minden and LAAP are used interchangeably. So let's just call it Camp Minden. Camp Minden is built on not one, but nine cemeteries. Are any of those Native American burial grounds? Uh, No, no. Uh, There may be some people uh, from Native American populations buried there, but they were were rural cemeteries that date through uh, different time periods, and they are now – you know, they they got a little bit better treatment than the the stories we hear about and things like poltergeist, right? They weren't they weren't just paved over. Uh, they are under the care of the U.S. government, so you can see existing uh, grave markers. They they took out there were these wooden grave markers, right, which are not going to hold up very well in the humid environment of Louisiana, and they were replaced with small concrete slabs. But the thing is, the slabs don't have the names of the deceased listed on the markers. They're just slabs, which is pretty sad, right? Uh, The cemeteries are Allentown, Crow, Jim Davis, Keene, Nottingham, uh, Rain, Richardson, Van Orsdell, and Walker. And the people who are buried there have their dates of birth and death and maybe a little bit of other information. But the problem is even if you are a descendant and you know where your ancestor is buried there, you can't visit the grounds to look for the grave. Uh, you, can't, you can't find them by the name. You know what I mean? My gosh. So, so it, is the, it is the site of nine cemeteries that the public is largely prohibited from visiting. That doesn't have a ton of stuff to do uh, ostensibly with today's episode, but it's weird. It is very weird that somehow through eminent domain, <laughs> the government just purchased, without really realizing it, nine cemeteries. Stole the dead. Ew. They stole your dead if you if you are descended from someone buried in those cemeteries. And they're manufacturing ammunition that steals life. That's – wow. Yeah, maybe, maybe we have an episode in the future on the strangest uh, cemeteries. We've never done that. Let's do it. Let's do it. I like it. I'm keeping count. Eminent domain, strangest cemeteries. But anyway, that that's a little bit of a side note. Uh, we do know that, to your point, Matt, uh, we see we see production wax and wane with this uh, with global conflict. Right, the the thing is not always open and pumping out bullets twenty four seven. Yeah, it was restored after World War II during the Korean conflict. Uh, and this was under Remington Rand, the, I'm assuming the company that actually was there producing yes. the stuff at the facility. And that was in 1951. Then employment at that time went from roughly zero to 5,000 in 1953, or I guess from zero before 1951, then up to 5,000 in 1953. Now, at Camp Minden, there was a metal forging and machining plant area, and it was known as the Y-Line Chromic Acid Etching Facility. The Y-Line Chromic Acid Etching Facility. Oh, (laughs) you'll (laughs) cave. And uh, it's fun to say even just in in full. Um, But it manufactured these specific uh, 155 millimeter projectiles. What would that be? What kind of weapon would that Is that just like a, a a specific caliber of bullet? Or is this like almost like a larger? That seems large. They're certainly projectiles, my friend, and they're 155 millimeters. Okay, a quick Google search indicated that these would have fed uh, an M777 howitzer, which is one of those uh, cannon-looking things that are on wheels. So, yeah. Yeah. They're also I, – I think they're um, kind of a, a, an all-purpose standard, at least in NATO. I, I, mm. I, don't, I don't know about on the other side of the curtain at this time as they called it, but yeah. These are yeah. These are not for handguns. 
<laughs> or not not for handguns that you could actually use. Yeah, these howitzers are the ones that you have to click, click, click and get them to go up at an angle and they shoot. They kind of lob these, this ordinance, and uh, has a nice arc trajectory and then comes down almost like a mortar round. I don't think it's quite a mortar round, but it's definitely not something you would fire point blank at something. You would shoot it and have it arc. Sounds terrifying. It does. So the plant is again reactivated during the Vietnam conflict, the Vietnam War. That was September 1961, and this time by a different RAND, Sperry RAND. And uh, this contractor held it until 1975 as that conflict was continuing. It produced all kinds of things, mines, fuses, Mm. shaped charges, bombs, boosters, demolition blocks, projectiles, really all the hits, all the things that make uh, humans – Um, no longer humans. And during this time, there were a couple of things that went wrong in the facility, a couple of tragic accidental explosions in 1962 and then again in 1968. But the show must go on, whether we're talking war or Broadway musical, right? So over the next few decades, employment waxed and waned in this facility, as we said, depending upon the ammunition needs of the military. This by the way, played economic havoc with the local community because this was one of the primary sources of employment for the surrounding area. There are a lot of towns in Mississippi, uh, in Louisiana, and even in Alabama as well, where the primary employer is a contractor uh, or a federal agency of some sort. I used to, uh, in another life, be in close contact with uh, people who would role play for military training in Louisiana, and their job was to act either as you know terrified civilians or belligerent civilians in case of urban warfare reenactments, mm-hmm. and it was terrible. They were paid like six bucks an hour. Well, and that's a really important skill because after the war ends, you've got a pretty lucrative career as a reenactor on your hands. There you there go. You go. <laughs> there you go. It, it uh, does remind me of the yeah. Lake City Quiet Pills episode that we did. Yes, yes, which I, I was thinking of earlier. That That's a real thing. and that We did okay. That was pretty well done. You yeah. Know? Thanks for everyone who wrote in to check on that because that – while that particular team – we don't want to spoil this for you. But while that particular team uh, associated with Lake City Quiet Pills is largely out of the running now from what we understand, uh, there are multiple other – let's call them independent operatives – independent post-military operatives out there uh, with surprisingly affordable rates. This is not a recommendation to hire them. Just want you to know that it's a real thing. So anyway, the whole role-playing thing that I'm mentioning is just to show how reliant many rural communities can become on these things. So imagine that the only solid job you can get in your town is making, making ammunition for the army and then the war stops – and your job stops. What are you going to do, you know? So let's fast forward to the present. This pattern exists, right? This waxing, this waning, this up and down frequency. Uh, and explosions aren't going to stop the show. On August 24th, 2006, there's another explosion. And this is during a time where the area is run by an outfit creatively named Explo Systems Incorporated. They had a site that was leased at Camp Menden, and bombs there were disassembled and recycled, in theory. Uh, this explosion in 2006 led to the evacuation of 600 schoolchildren nearby. Luckily, there were no injuries or fatalities that time around. However, this was still not the last explosion. Um, maybe we can – hey, Mission Control, can uh, we throw to a clip here? First, I saw the sky light up in the west, just a loud, and you know, it wasn't no noise, no, it just lit up. And I had caught my eye, I looked you know, to the west, and then it, the, the light died down. Look, the boys, hey, what was that? He looked up and I saw that, and it lit up again, and then next thing we heard the loud boom. It looked like a sunset, it was so bright. So, what's that guy describing in that clip? Well, uh, he is describing a massive explosion that he saw take place at the plant. But yeah, and and this is the one in 2012 or is that yes. this is, and this is the one that was it was huge. It was 15 million pounds of this stuff called M6 propellant. Um and this is again the Explo Systems Incorporated, the the company that's operating it. Um it was 
uh, huge. I mean, you, the way he's talking about it, it sounds like a nuclear explosion when you mm-hmm. see the old footage of those. Or maybe one of the ones at a chemical plant in China that I think many of us have probably seen videos mm-hmm. of. Mm-hmm. Um, it sounds massive. It And it was. It just just rocked Camp Minden. It shattered windows up to four miles away and it created a 7,000 foot mushroom cloud that ended up like the stuff that's in that cloud ended up contaminating much of the surrounding area. We were talking a little bit about this off air and and, and no spoilers for anyone, but this is something that really happened. It reminds me of uh, the Chernobyl incident when, which is a fantastic series on HBO right now, when that explosion took place, people could see it from miles away in the city and it didn't create a mushroom cloud, but it created this crazy like light shining up in the sky and people were just remarking upon it about how beautiful it was. It's very, it's very, it's very upsetting the way it's portrayed in the show. So the vast majority of people in 2012 and today, and if we're being honest, any time after World War II are going to equate a mushroom cloud with what? A nuclear detonation. So the question immediately becomes, what the hell happened in Camp Minden? We'll explore the answers after a word from our sponsor. Here's where it gets crazy. So remember those contractors we mentioned earlier? That's probably one of the most important points of the first part of our show is that while this is a, a, a an Uncle Sam production, while Uncle Sam is, you know, the studio or whatever, the people doing the work are – these private contractors, you know, a panoply of RANDs uh, and a number of any other contractors. Explo Systems was one of the most prominent. So those of us who are hearing this name are starting to put the pieces together, right? Explo Systems? Yeah. Not the, not the most brilliant – uh, the most brilliant uh, creative naming, uh, but like Explo, short for explosion, right? Or maybe exploration, maybe I'm profiling, but what – is slash was Explo Systems. They were a private company whose primary business operations involved the uh, demilitarization of military munitions and then, of course, uh, selling those things again, like the recovered explosive materials uh, that you'll find in oper- – uh, well, you'll find – okay. Let's put it this way. You find – munitions that were used in war or meant for war and then you're going to resell or repurpose those for mining. Oh, OK. All right. So uh, maybe mining, maybe also construction uh, such as uh, the creation of roadways that cut through mountains where you oh. have to blast rock or through or tunnel through Ex- rock. Exactly. For mining like that, you can even imagine using it for uh, like demolition of something that you need for a house or for a big mm-hmm. facility, something like that. OK. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> have you Have you guys seen actual demolition in real life? I know a, you have. We had a big one here in town recently. The, it was an old archive building that they took down um, mm-hmm. and that's – they kind of do it from the bottom down I guess. Yeah. I went to I went to see that and uh, one of our friends of the show, a producer here named Ramsey Yunt was filming it. It was weird. We met the governor who was dressed like a, a leather cowboy at the time. It was <laughs> – it's very, very strange. Also, very early in the morning because they don't want to mess up traffic. So uh, he was wearing his demolition outfit. You know, yeah. Perhaps that was it. Perhaps that was it. Uh, but, but I asked that. I, I mentioned that just because, you know, it, these are legitimate uses for this this kind of substance, right? Mm-hmm. You know, there's nothing against the law about demolishing a building. There are actually quite a few laws about how to do it correctly. Yeah. And just a little background on on the substance in question, this M6 propellant. It's a military-grade explosive propellant that's used for triggering, firing off this heavy artillery, like those howitzers we were talking about. Um, And it actually comes in bags and these grains that are of different shapes and sizes, and they're very large. They can be up to an inch long, and the bags, almost picture it as like an explosive bean bag that's packed in to the bottom of the gun, depending on how far the projectile needs to go. So there's different, they're great differently for distance. Right, right, right. And there are different formulations of propellant, right? M6 is only one of these. But the the thing about it is that this is one of the most common, you know, because it's it's easier when you manufacture at scale, it's easier to manufacture the same thing repeatedly, right? Rather than um, a mixed fruit cup. <laughs> I should probably eat lunch at some point. Uh, so, 
so yes, the U.S. Army wanted Explo to take all of this unused propellant and to store it and then resell it. And they're already kind of sitting pretty, right? We're paying you, we're paying you millions of dollars for this stuff that we're giving you. You just have to pay to store it, but then you resell it. And Explo says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to sell it to, uh, to, you know, like that Chicago poem by Carl Sandburg. We're gonna we're gonna sell it to the construction workers. We're gonna sell it to the the uh, butchers, the hog stackers, or whatever of the world. Anybody that needs to blow something up. Anyone who needs to blow something up in a lawful way yeah, yeah. Uh, gets gets some of this M six. Everything must go. Uh, so the contract had all the basic requirements, right? Explo needed to document the sale of everything. They needed to certify its compliance with federal law and submit official certificates to the Army. Just by the book, the way you would have to handle any transaction with any hazardous material, right? Spoiler alert, they did not do that. Not once, not never. So what did they do? Okay, so let's just recap. The U.S. Army actually spent eight point six. They awarded Explo. And whenever, whenever I hear Explo, what's the what's the second part? Explo systems. systems. I think of that tenacious D song, Explosivo. Nice. Every time. So I'm just going to call it Explosivo from now on. Yeah, they gave they awarded Explo eight point six million dollars in contract funds to demilitarize one point three five million propelling charges that contain this M six propellant. Okay, just to recap. So they didn't do that. What did they do? Okay. It turns out they entered into a very, very real-life conspiracy, which we love here on Stuff They Don't Want You to Know. Uh, the management of Explo didn't even make an attempt at reselling any of these explosives. Instead, they stockpiled them. Super weirdly. Stockpiling, I would say, is a very generous term. Yeah. Stockpiling makes it sound – Orderly or labeled. Let's call it hoarded, though. The, yes, that's it. Yeah. Very I mean, unsafely. Like, <laughs> right. Because the bags we mentioned that contain the M6 are opened. They're opened to the air. They're laying around in corners and they're intentionally hidden. You know, uh, like in episodes of Hoarders where someone says, all right, this pile of papers, uh, this pile of entertainment weeklies from the early 1990s is fine, but I don't want them to know how many dead cats I have. So I'm going to put those in a corner behind the used diapers, which are perp- perfectly respectable things to hoard. Oh, totally. So they, so they treat these things like dead cats, right? Uh, they hide them in these various corners. They hide them away from uh, the places where they would legally be required to put them. Because officially now, these stockpiles do not exist. From January 2010 to November 2012, Explo ran a con game on the United States of America. They submitted false certificates to the U.S. Army. They were supposed to submit real certificates. Mm -hmm. Uh, They they, under – Cover of night, if we want to be dramatic. Uh, They transported hazardous waste to facilities where it was illegal to store them. And then they stored them, you know, like just tossing bags around into the corner. And some, if anything, it's a surprise that this stuff didn't explode earlier. And the reason they did it this way is because they were able to continue milking the government for money by by saying, okay, we've sold – this to these people or, but you know, just keep paying these invisible things that we have set up. Uh, they even said that – they even made up sales. They just completely said, OK, we sold this to this other company that may or may not exist. Wait a minute, Ben. Are you telling me that a company that has like a name that sounds like it's straight out of like idiocracy – was not on the up and up, and then a company called Explo Corp or whatever <laughs> Systems Systems was going to make stuff that would go boom. Just, Is that what you're telling me? And just hang on to it and, and just, just hang, just on, hang to on to it. it. <laughs> they were not going to let that stuff go. It makes you wonder who they were really going to sell it to, and what they were actually going to do with it. Possibly <laughs> some sort of uh, strange foreign deal. With military militant groups, right? I'm just conjecturing here. Well, mm-hmm. we're gonna look into some of that, and it definitely feels like they they wanted to make more money on it, or they at least should have, because that's just more money on top. If you're you're already mm-hmm. got a contract to sell it, and now you're selling it, uh, but that's officially what those false certificates are doing, right? They're getting paid mm-hmm. for nothing. Weren't they supposed to decommission it though? Am I misunderstanding here? Like, weren't they supposed to 
like render it inert or get rid of it? Like I don't, I don't understand. Why were they holding on to it? Capitalism, baby. Okay. Skip the turkey. Go okay. straight for the gravy. Uh, yeah, demilitarizing it would mean that they remove the propellant from any associated uh, paraphernalia or equipment that would make it a weapon of war. That's right. right. The so it's like – it's like, yeah, maybe it's illegal to sell cars, but it's legal to sell gasoline, right? That's what makes yeah, a car yeah. go. So their job is to take the gasoline out of the car and just sell the gas. There you go. And what they did instead was they took the gas out and then, they, you know, again, they put it in open bags and threw it in the corner on top of it. And then they Jeez. said they sold it. It's, I mean, it's, I, I'm laughing because it's ridiculous. It's catch 22 level uh, or idiocracy level to, to your point, Noel, uh, kind of stuff. So the Explo officials, including uh, Vice President of Operations, a guy named William Terry Wright, uh, in addition to making up these sales, they also did not tell the people uh, in these third parties that they that they were uh, allegedly buying this stuff. So these other companies have no idea what the hell's going on. They also had their signatures forged or fabricated. And then the people at the top of the chain, the executives, order lower level employees uh, to not only move this stuff once, but to move it multiple times whenever government officials come around to check in on things. Wow. So imagine you get the call and say, okay, we need to move. Again, like to your point, Matt, it's millions of pounds of explosive or propellant. Yeah, and highly dangerous and just continually moving it around in this big facility. It just seems like a recipe for disaster. Totally. Mm -hmm. And the and – the, uh, <laughs> The forgery doesn't stop there. This con game, like a lot of con games, is not sustainable over the long term. So it quickly kind of uh, spirals downward and they have to create more and more false documents to try to cover up their original lie or their mistake or their oversight or whatever you want to call it, depending on how charitable you feel about the human condition as you hear this today. So one other example would be that they started uh, making fake paperwork for landfills in Louisiana and Arkansas to say that the stuff they did they did actually ship to landfills was not hazardous. It was. Uh, spoiler alert. So all of this added up to, you said millions of pounds, that's literally 7,800-something tons of M6 propellant that is just hidden at Camp Minden. And eventually, they get discovered because of that enormous explosion. And we played that clip to take, a, to take us all back in that, in that time and space. You know, uh, imagine where you live, where, whatever, when you hear the word home, whatever you think of when you hear the word home. Uh, imagine that one, one afternoon, or, you know, one night, whatever, you hear this, you don't even hear a sound. The ground beneath you shakes. The windows shatter. You hear uh, 10,000 car alarms go off at once, right? Dogs and cats are d going crazy. <laughs> uh, and, the, and then the sky lights up and you see things flying through the sky, which is a detail that becomes very important later. Of course, you think that it's an act of violence, right? It doesn't feel like an accident. It's a violent act mm -hmm. that feels like an act of violence. Hey, that is very well <laughs> done, man. A violent act that feels like an act of violence. Yes, just so. Uh, so the the news goes crazy, right? They're they're trying to figure out what happened. Uh, they're they're asking all these questions. Well. We'll bracket that for a second. So let's just go to what the authorities initially said. Captain Doug Kane, who was a spokesman for the state police, said that the – surprise, surprise, the, the cause of this massive explosion was all this M6 propellant used as, as you had noted, Noel, in howitzers and other artillery. The pellets are mainly – this compressed substance called nitrocellulose. It's also sometimes called gun cotton. Authorities initially said 
there was a total of 450 tons after an investigator looking into that October 15th explosion saw cardboard boxes and rows and rows of pallets just chilling behind a building. But then they found more stacked in sheds and warehouses and they started trying to move <laughs> They started trying to move it, uh, and it wasn't – the problem they had uh, was that for a minute, this hoarding or hiding away of the stuff actually worked. Legally, they were supposed to put this in a thing called a storage magazine, and they had instead hidden it away because they wanted it to look like they were selling this stuff. Uh, this stuff is also known as flash paper. You might have heard it referred to as such. Mm. Mm. So – they had uh, they had tried to move it back and forth. The authorities were trying to move the stuff that hadn't exploded, and that is the official narrative so far. That's the official. That's what you will hear on the news. That's what you will hear when you uh, read about the the later court cases and stuff that come about because of this. However, there is more to the story. Some people you see allege that a cover up exists. What are we talking about? We'll tell you after a word from our sponsor. And we're back. So as we said, what we've explored thus far is the official story. That's the thing that comes across the news waves to you. The 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 PR documentation lets you know that's what's going on and uh, that's what goes down in the history books. But guess what? There are other explanations out there. Some a little more odd than others, but almost all of them reek of some kind of cover-up that was afoot here. Right, like we said before, given that massive mushroom cloud, it's completely understandable that some people would fear a nuclear detonation, right? Or some kind of attack at least, or, Mm -hmm. or, you know— uh, it, something went wrong other than an accident. Right. And the the idea of nuclear power terrorism is at the forefront of a lot of people's minds due to active negotiations with uh, the DPRK uh, in the attempt to verify or disarm nukes, the concerns of uh, quote-unquote rogue nukes uh, or suitcase nukes. The dirty bombs. Dirty bombs. The dirty bombs, not to be confused with our local dirty birds. That's right. (laughs) Also sometimes bomb. (laughs) Sports jokes. So it's interesting because the Shreveport Times shortly after this reported a number of what you could call conspiracy theories or alternative theories or at the very least – uh, eyewitness reports that contradict the official narrative. Uh, But that article and uh, subsequent related articles appear to have been scrubbed from the internet. I could not find them even using one of our favorite tools, the Wayback Machine. Oh, man. I love that thing. Uh, One article that did survive is pretty fascinating, uh, if not – well – Let's present it first for everyone's consideration without commentary and then maybe we can go back and, and, and pick it apart a little. This comes to us from Joe Quinn who is writing at opednews.com. So in opednews.com, Joe Quinn reports that folks across Texas, Louisiana, and Mississippi saw bright flashes in the sky, and he described them having seen fireball trails as well. And then in Shreveport, the Shreveport area of northwest Louisiana, a lot of folks heard um, earth-shaking booms that caused houses to rattle in their foundations, and windows were broken all throughout Minden. Um, And so here's a quote from Amy Mealy, who was one of the residents who lived just a couple of miles from Camp Minden. Yeah, she genuinely thought that she was being bombed. That's what she, that's what she said. I honestly thought we were being bombed. And uh, she said it was one of the scariest things that she's ever been through. Um, and, you know, she was – like she describes how she's checking some emails, right? She's about to go to bed. You look at your phone or whatever you can do. Your, you check your email, make sure everything's okay. And she said she had an odd feeling in the pit of her stomach. She said it was, quote, like a rolling thunder in the distance. And uh, and then she said it was getting closer and closer. And she said she felt everything moving with me. I could literally feel it moving toward me. That's a that's pretty crazy, right? And and that's right before the actual explosion hit. 
Ah, see, the chronology becomes interesting here. Yeah, because dozens of people, this is still from op-ed news, uh, dozens of people, Quinn writes, called the Webster Parish Sheriff's Office as well as the local news station, KSLA News 12, and they reported seeing flashes of light in the sky and hearing multiple loud booms that shook houses. The sheriff's office initially stated that there was a, quote, possibility that a meteor hit the ground in the area. The following morning, however, they uh, recanted and the parish sheriff at the time, Gary Sexton, said that hazmat experts told him what people had seen and heard was an underground bunker containing explosives that blew up that late night uh, on October 15th. Not only was there nothing to see here, but the explosion, quote, worked exactly as it was designed to do. And the use of the phrase designed was somewhat unfortunate for the sheriff's department at that time because it left the door open for conjecture. Uh, Quinn and other people who doubt the official narrative still have questions. Uh, Quinn puts it this way beautifully. He says, what are the odds that at around the same time as people across three states, Mississippi, Texas, and Louisiana, and hundreds of miles apart, were seeing what was clearly a meteorite comet fragment burning up in the lower Earth atmosphere – a munitions dump would explode at the same time. Whoa. More to the point, if a munitions dump did explode, what are the odds that a meteorite or comet fragment that many eyewitnesses believe hit the ground in the area would be in no way connected to the explosion? So enticing, tantalizing, tempting, right? But we also have to we also have to think about how close the timeline can become here. It could seem like a meteor, right, depending on some, where someone's standing and what they're seeing at the time. We talked about this before with MUFON and different UFO observations, right? Light, Yeah, light in the atmosphere can be tricky. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the whole thing is one big Shyamalan. And the, the problem is that someone could be far enough away that they see a light, but they don't hear a sound or necessarily feel a tremor, right? Yes. So they could see debris from an explosion launched so high that they feel they're watching a meteor crash. So it could just be the explosion. But but that hasn't prevented people from saying, no, there is a cover-up, a meteor hit, and then they – that's the thing for me. They blew up a military base – the meteor to did? cover it up? <laughs> oh, yeah, uh, yeah. No, I, I know what you're saying. It's kind of like the Titanic uh, conspiracy when they're like, the best way to kill the people who don't like the Federal Reserve is to get them on this massive boat. And under false sinking. pretenses. Uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it seems that if we're exercising Occam's razor here, the idea that between the two conspiracies, the idea that there's a cover-up of a cover-up, right? Uh, it seems that maybe the mundane answer is the more accurate one, but it doesn't make it any uh, less disgusting in terms of corruption. Uh, yeah. Luckily, there are two pieces of good news here. First, thankfully, no one that we know of was actually injured in this in this debacle. And second, in a in a rare example of corporate justice, the higher-ups at Explo did end up going to court. So it wasn't just – you know, the way it happens with banks. It wasn't just that the bank was fined some portion of their profits and was able to write it off as a cost of doing business. Uh, the individuals involved actually had legal consequences. Yes, the the co-owner, a man named David Allen Smith, who was 63 years old at the time, uh, he was sentenced to 55 months in prison because of all this. Yeesh. Yeah, and uh, and also three years of supervised, uh, I guess, what what is that? Super supervised probation, probation essentially. Yeah. yeah. Um, and uh, after he was released, and he was also fined uh, 34 million dollars. What? Yeah, is almost that like a almost 35 fine? million. Well, was this guy a super rich man? Well, it was almost $35 million. Again, he's he's the co-owner of this company, okay. right? And he was taking part in that conspiracy we were talking about right. of bilking the, the you, government. There's a lot of rings of Chernobyl in this story. You know, not to spoil anything, but it's like it's, it's corruption. It's cover-up. It's failure to do the right thing to protect the people that live in the vicinity of your 
you know, facility. With very dangerous things, yeah. uh, products at the center. Products of it. at the center of it, yeah. Well, and, and, yeah. and here's the thing. David Allen Smith, he's not the only guy that went to prison. Right. There was uh, William Terry Wright. We mentioned him earlier. He was sentenced to 60 months in prison, three years of supervised release. Uh, and he, because he wasn't an owner, I guess. He was the VP of operations, I right, believe. Right. He had to pay uh, just under 150000 in restitution for participating in the criminal conspiracy. And there were three other big names that also had to to take a dive. Yeah, there was the director of support technology, a man by the name of Charles Ferris Callahan, who was 69 um, from Shreveport. He got 24 months in the in the clink, uh, one year of supervised probation, um, and had to pay 207,599 bucks in restitution for falsely representing the facts in various documents. Then, of course, you get over to uh, Kenneth Wayne Lampkin. He was the uh, – this is his title, M6 Demil, like as in Demolition Program Manager. They're all about the little snappy, you know, short, yeah. shortenings. Well, yeah, and uh, he got himself 45 months in prison and uh, three years of that old uh, fun thing, supervised release or probation. Mm. And he was fined, you know, again, similarly um, to William Terry Wright, $149,000 in restitution. And his was for specifically making false statements. And last but not least, there was traffic and inventory control manager Lionel Wayne Coons with a K uh, who had to go with 41 months in prison, three years of supervised release. And he got off relatively easily in terms of restitution. He only had to pay $92,921 only. I mean, I don't have that sitting around. I don't know about you guys. but Well, it's kind of – it's kind of like anchoring on menus, you know, the the psychological thing where you show people a larger price first and then the, you get them to forget how high the lowest price thing is. Sure. We could – we should go into psychology of menus one I day. I think that's smart. Uh, so these people did actually go uh, – they did go to court. They did get found guilty. It was a real conspiracy. The question for people who are out there – a little more in the fringe of the reporting is whether or not there was a that was whether or not this conspiracy is a cover up for something else at play. We did not find a ton of evidence for that. It seemed more like the fog of war and the panic of trying to report things as they're happening. But hey, if you are from the area and you know something else that was a miss at the time, we would love to hear from you. And also, if you're not from the area, can you recall any other strange cases like this in your neck of the global woods? What popped up in the news only to disappear a few days later? Like one day, True story. Long-time listeners remember this. Uh, One day here in our fair semi-metropolis of Atlanta, a piece of the highway just collapsed, uh, Interstate 85. And for for several months afterwards, uh, the story that the local government was pushing was that a – A homeless person who struggled with substance abuse problems had set a fire in a shopping cart and that that uh, resulted in the bridge collapsing. Yeah, because stone totally melts, you know, with with garbage can fires. Right. Well, I mean, you know, there was supposedly some other propellant down there, things that were used to burn. Stockpiling. Yeah. (laughs) Well (laughs) done. Under the bridge. Yeah. He's smart. No red hot chili peppers. He recently started an LLC called Explo uh, Party Incorporated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, they had to figure out some way to use all those demilitarized ordinance, you know. Right, right. Let's use it for a nice uh, fireworks display on the downtown Atlanta skyline. And his alias, of course, was uh, Bridge Blowington. Yes. Yep. So, I, I mean, that I, it's weird because that I-85 collapse is, is a pretty good example of how quickly these things can pop in and out of the news. So we would be curious to hear your stories or your versions of this because the the truth of the matter is now that – our biological attention spans have been surpassed by our technological ability to disseminate stories. So it is difficult. It, it, there's that old saying that, uh, you know, you can't keep your eye – you can't watch every falling sparrow or whatever. 
uh, for humans, that's always been difficult, and now it is impossible. So it's quite, it's it's I, it's not even possible. It is plausible that some crazy thing happened in like Scranton, Pennsylvania, and only the people uh, in part of Scranton, Pennsylvania, know what went down. We want to hear those stories, and we want to share them with your fellow listeners. Yes, please find us all over the place: Facebook, Twitter, uh, Instagram. You could do all those things. Call our number. One eight three three S T D W Y T K. Give us the scoops because we wanna we wanna spread those two scoops. Yeah, if two, you please. two and a half if possible, uh, but keep it to three minutes. How many scoops are in raisin bran? Uh, two, 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 scoops. Scoops. two scoops of raisins. Two scoops that's of raisins. The, yeah. Just raisins. That's not counting the brand. What size scoop, though? That's the question. You know, they're fairly vague about it. It <laughs> looks, uh, you know, they, they don't give you the uh, volume yeah. of the yeah. scoop. Sort they of just fistful. show the yeah. scoop. Uh-huh. And, and they, kind of, they kind of imply that all other cereals are short scooping you. I agree. See? I agree. And then it says actual size underneath the scoop. It's exactly it right. It doesn't actually. And if you feel so compelled that uh, you want to explore any of our private lives, um, you can check me out on Instagram where I am. I've changed it up. I am now at How Now Noel Brown. Wow. Yeah. It's time for a change. I like it. Embryonic Insider. That was, that was, that was a relic from my past. Time to move on. Let's see. You can see me uh, currently. I I managed to get in and out of Belgium without too much weird custom stuff. Uh, you can see some of the stories from that over at, at Ben Bolin. Uh, funny story. I ran into the same customs agent going out as I did going in, and I think I made a friend. Maybe a fan of the show. I don't know. Really? Yeah. If you are, if you happen to be listening. <laughs> I mean, conversely, you can check Matt out at, at TSA. Uh, well, yeah, you can also find me at X, at Explo Summer. Uh, it's you know a mission about education. Not Matt, really. Matt has many aliases <laughs> on the interwebs. You can find me on at slightly darker sunglasses than yours. These are all your kind of like hype beast kind of accounts, huh? Yes. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. You know what? If you don't want to do any of that, you don't want to go on Instagram. Who, who, who likes Instagram anyway? You're just feeding the machine, feeding the beast. You can do it the old-fashioned way. You can get in touch with us directly. Well, actually, did we mention the Facebook group? Here's where it gets crazy. Don't know if we did or not. If we didn't, you can go to that. Uh, but if you want to do that either, you can also just send us a good old-fashioned email where we are. Conspiracy at iHeartRadio.com. Stuff They Don't Want You to Know is a production of iHeartRadio's How Stuff Works. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.